My heart is full. I've been with the saints of God over this weekend, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. As Ben mentioned, we had a chance to go to Ignite. I think Richard, Brandon, and your brother were down there. There's may, maybe others that were here, but gathered at Liberty, uh, I'm not Liberty, gathered at Thomas Rhodes. There was about 3,000, some men, maybe more, all worshiping God, and we were really encouraged. And Saturday morning, uh, I come here at 8 o'clock, and uh, the guys have cooked up a great breakfast. We had a good Bible study. Uh, we're embracing one another, handshaking, you know, talking about what it means to be a godly man. And then uh, <clears throat> Ben and I had a chance to return and uh, finish the afternoon down uh, at the men's conference. And then I arrived here this morning, and all you people said no to the snow and came to church. <laughs> and people drinking coffee and telling stories. And it, I tell you, Jesus' family is such an encouragement. And we need to be part of this family. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, it is so good to belong to God's family. Here's a family that's in the news a lot, uh, right? Uh, well, not in my news, but maybe, maybe in some people's news, right? Uh, it's the royal family of Great Britain, and two of those family members recently wanted out. Uh, <clears throat> several years ago, Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, uh, decided that they wanted to uh, walk away from all the responsibilities and privileges of being part of that royal family. And this ongoing saga, this drama, has made them some money on a Netflix series uh, entitled uh, Harry and Meghan, and they've cashed in on all of this. It's interesting to me the fascination with the dysfunction of that royal family. And, you know, it's like people are like, what else are they going to do? And, <clears throat> and so that makes the news. Now, I doubt if there's anyone here that's going to become part of that royal family. I mean, there's a possibility, but... Uh, but we have the opportunity to be part of a divine family that comes with even better uh, uh, privileges and even more important responsibilities, Jesus' family. We need to belong to Jesus' family. We need family. We need try. Many, many of you have great families. I've sat at your table. I've watched your children be born or graduate. Uh, I've, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by so many parents and grandparents in this community of faith that take their family seriously. And so what we're talking about here today is not to push aside uh, our, our blood families, but it's just to emphasize the importance of belonging to Jesus's family. And, and we need this family. One thing the COVID pandemic revealed is that uh, isolation plays havoc on a person's mental health. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, there, you know, isolation plus hopelessness equals a dead end. And in Jesus's family, here at this congregation, here at this church, some of you watching online, if you have, are part of this church and you're watching from home because of the snow storm that we had, then uh, I just want you to type in the chat right now, I uh, uh, love, love Cornerstone, put that in there and you'll be forgiven for not being here. But anyway, <laughs> but, any, but anyway, right, some of you are like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, one time, this is a side, one time I, we rolled up in here and there was a Holland tractor uh, on, in the parking lot and uh, it was Mr. Gillespie, he drove his tractor to church, I could just, he was, it was a proud moment for him. Uh, it's the only time I've ever been to church where tractors were in the parking lot. But anyway, <laughs> we have witnessed some amazing stories unfold in this family that we call uh, the church or the cornerstone. Uh, we have witnessed people overcome addiction. We've witnessed people uh, go through divorce and come out on the other end and remarry. We've witnessed people... Uh, uh, survive, not only survive, but even flourish, uh, going through the death of a loved one. They, they, they mourn that loss and the church came around them. We've seen people overcome depress depression and family dysfunction. I mean, it is amazing when we think about the, uh, the, the stories that God works in, through his family. Belonging to Jesus's family is far more important than belonging to any 
other family. My friend and professor from Johnson, Dr. Daniel Overdorf, wrote this. He said, God designed his children to live in relationship with one another. And he designed the context in which these relationships blossom and thrive, the church. The church provides an immediate family for all who can confess faith in Christ. Not a perfect family by any means, but a family nonetheless. The Bible knows nothing of an orphaned Christian. Rather, it describes believers as fellow fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, Ephesians 2.19. Tied together by a common faith, we grow together as we grow in Christ. I love the church. I love God's family. And the one thing that I want everyone to get out of this message today is you need to belong to Jesus' family, and we need to tell others about how good it is to belong to Jesus' family. A preacher shared this story that so moved me. At the end of a Sunday service, uh, a couple comes down with their baby wrapped in a blanket, and uh, they asked the preacher, they said, would you, would you pray over our child, their newborn child? And, and he said, sure. And so they hand the baby uh, to the preacher, and he pulls back uh, the blanket, and his knees buckled. He had never saw a baby so disformed. The baby was born with a severe birth defect. The face was caved in, and he was in shock. And the mother said, <clears throat> this is Emily. She only has six days to live, according to the doctors, and I'm asking you to just pray that Emily would know that her parents loved her before she goes to be with Jesus. And so the preacher, you know, he said an appropriate prayer, and uh, then he returned the baby wrapped in the blanket back to the mother's arms, and then the preacher said, is there anything else that the church can do? And the father said, preacher, we're okay. No, we really are okay. You see, for the past several years, we've belonged to a small group, part of this church. We always attend church together. And they have been there with us at the birth of Emily. Uh, They were there when we came home. They had cleaned the house, prepared meals. They're even helping us plan her funeral. That we're really, we're okay. And then three other couples come up and surrounded them. And they all embraced and hugged each other. And they walked out the side aisle, uh, out, <clears throat> out into the lobby, and the preacher just stood there and wept. And he said to himself, where would they be without the church? Our families are important to us, and they should be. But there are many things that we face in life that our blood families cannot see us through. We need Jesus' family. We need the eternal family of God. I hope that as we look at this passage today, you come to the same understanding that Jesus uh, has about his family, how important it is, how important it is for us to belong to the family of Christ. So life is tough, and we need to belong to each other, as Ben was talking about, Uh, to survive some of the difficulties that we face. How do we get into Jesus' family? Now, we know Jesus had a biological family, right? Jesus' mother was Mary, Joseph's stepfather. We know he has brothers and sisters. But we discover in Mark chapter 3, he has a spiritual family that is important. Now, fun fact, as we read the New Testament, as we read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then we go to the next book, the book of Acts, we see the word disciple have preeminence in describing a follower of Christ. Uh, A a disciple is a witnessing learner of Jesus. But then, as we read the rest of the letters, the words, the words, uh, family words like brother, sister, family of God, uh, they begin to surface and be elevated. And here's what I come, this is my understanding of what's going on there, is that (laughs) Jesus' family, uh, when he introduces this uh, to, uh, to the world, 
it's, it's a shocker to them like it sometimes is a shocker to us. And they were beginning to understand what it meant to be part of God's family. It took some time for them to develop those relationships and principles for governing a family and making it healthy and whole and applying the principles to Jesus. But anyway, uh, we see this the, the words family be elevated as the book of the Bible comes to a conclusion. And so words like brother and sister become far more important important than they ever were before. So today we're going to answer this question and some background to Mark chapter 3. In Jesus' culture, acceptance and identity came from tribe, trade, and family, not personal choice. You know, in our culture today and in our world, an individual will often choose their own identity or tribe uh, through their lifestyle or through the choices that they make, maybe the dress uh, that they have. But when Jesus lived, a person's occupation was passed on to them by their parents. Their marriages were arranged. Their meals that they shared were shared with family members, and you didn't go out to eat with people you didn't know. Uh, bound, the meals were boundary markers. They, were, they identified you with, this is, this is my family. They reinforced what it meant to be part of a family. So to eat with outsiders and ignore your own people was simply unacceptable. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus turns all that on its head. Uh, Jesus' life, is, he, he is a revolutionary And he is teaching people what it means to belong to God's family. And no longer will acceptance be something chosen for you or your identity chosen for you. It's something that you will choose based on your relationship with Jesus. And so uh, in all of this family talk in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, uh, Jesus' family comes to take him away. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then Jesus' response. In the middle of that story is the story uh, where the, the Pharisees or, or the religious scribes of that day, they're accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And so what we're going to see here in this passage we're about to read is that Jesus is receiving opposition from all sides. His family thinks he's lost it. And, he, and the scribes and the Pharisees think he's doing this work by the power of the devil. So Jesus is opposed on both sides. Now, with that background in mind, let's read uh, Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. But the teachers of the religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets his power to cast out demons. Now, most likely, this house in Capernaum is Peter's house. It's in this house Jesus has taught and previously done miracles. Maybe even uh, the the, uh, paralytic that came through the roof took place there. He, He has performed miracles. Jesus is in this this year of popularity, he's a big man on campus. Everybody wants to be near him. Everybody wants to uh, hear him and be healed by him. And so this place is packed with people. Jesus is mobbed from everywhere he goes. And Jesus' blood family comes to rescue him and protect the family name because their brother, their son, is, <clears throat> is claiming that he's Messiah. And they think he's lost it. They do not understand. At this point in their story, they are not believers in Jesus. Mary's not. James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, his brothers and his sisters, as far as we know, none of them are believers. Now, that point, that will change after the resurrection. We know at least two of those brothers become to be church leaders. We know Mary becomes a believer. But at this time in their story, in Jesus' story, they are unbelievers. All of them will have to come to faith in Christ. All of them will need to be baptized into Christ. All of them will need to make a choice to follow Jesus. But at this point, they've come to take him away. Ha ha ho 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 ho. They come to take him away. Ha 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 ho ho ho. Right? Right? Ron Dawson? You know what I'm talking about, right? Now, not that Ron's been taken away, but sometimes he thinks I'm crazy. So anyway, they've come. Katero is the word to take him away. 
Now let's jump to the end of this section, okay? We're going to skip the middle section for right now. We're going to go to the end, verse 31. <clears throat> then Jesus said to his mother, it's almost a repeat, his brothers came to see him. He stood outside and they stood outside to send word for him to come and talk with them. There was the crowd sitting around Jesus and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. And so, as I mentioned, th at this point, the, Jesus' family and the religious people are outsiders, and the ones who are the insiders are the ones who are listening to what Jesus says and trying to obey it. Now, Jesus is not disrespecting his mom right here. Actually, what Jesus is doing, he's exalting those. You know, the Jews had very high regard for their parents. It's one of the commandments, right? Honor your father and mother. So Jesus isn't breaking a commandment here. Rather, he's exalting those who hear and obey his teachings. And then we see the love that Jesus shows breaks down the common barriers of acceptance in that culture, just like it does today. He was known, Jesus was known to eat with sinners, to talk with Samaritans, to touch lepers, to cast out demons of people uh, that everyone else was terrified. Everyone else would run away from, and Jesus would go up and talk to them. And that was just unacceptable by their standards. So take note of this. Those who are out are often the least expected. And those who are in are often the least likely. And Mark goes out of his way to show us that those whom we typically expect to be insiders, like Jesus' family and religious leaders, these blood relatives, these ones who know the law, they're not. So let's make a couple observations real quickly. First, we know this. Family cannot save us. No one gets to heaven on a buddy pass. You have to make your own decision about Jesus. A conscious confession of who Christ is in your life. It's up to you. The faith of your mom, the faith of your dad, the faith of your wife, the faith of your husband, the faith of your grandparent won't save you. Your faith in Christ is what brings salvation. And so, uh, so, so, so like the, the faith act of your parents baptizing you as an infant will not save you. That's great on their, they were doing what they were taught. They were honoring the teaching they received. Uh, the, this act of faith that they do, it, it, they're trying to uh, bring salvation into your life. But we know from reading the Bible that believers are baptized. And an infant is not a believer. You have to make your own choice. Your faith of your parents or grandparents cannot save you. Being born in a Christian family makes you a Christian the same way being born in a garage makes you a car. You know, it's just, it just doesn't equate. You know, it doesn't. Our, our bloodline cannot save us, but the shed blood of Christ can. We must be born again. Even Jesus' mother, Mary, had to be baptized, had to come to faith, and had to choose to follow Jesus. Second, <clears throat> religion cannot save us. The teachers of the religious law, they're the church going, Bible memorizing, only listen to the K-love music, moral majority of the day. And they were not in Jesus' family. Religious performance does not pay, make us part of Jesus' family. So those who are often, th those who are out are often the people that we would think we're in. It's, you know, some people call Jesus' kingdom the upside-down kingdom, but I call it the right-side-up kingdom. I mean, it really is. Listen, I want you to listen to Jesus' words again. I want you to hear it from Matthew's account of the story, and I want you to hear it from the message translation. So let's read this again. Then he, he then, Jesus, stretched out his hand towards his disciples, and he said, look closely. These are my mother and brothers. Obedience is thicker than blood. 
The person who obeys my heavenly Father's will is my brother, sister, and mother. So Jesus is pointing at least to 11 of the 12 disciples. Consider who Jesus is pointing to. Peter, the impulsive. John, the judgmental. Thomas, the doubter. Simon, the zealot. The least likely. And we think Jesus is doing something new. But if you go back and you read through the Old Testament, you'll hear stories that sound a lot like what's going on here right now. It's not that God is, is doing something completely different. Actually, if you read the whole counsel of God, the whole story of the Bible, you'll see God uses the least likely to do amazing things. For example, Noah got drunk in the Old Testament after building the ark and saving humanity. Job suffered disaster even though he was a righteous man. Abraham was cowardly at times. Jacob was a cheater. Moses had a violent temper. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a hothead womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. David committed adultery and murder. Elijah suffered depression. Picture the scene as Jesus points to these unlikely people as his family. And so in Jesus' words, we must see both the warning here and the encouragement. Nobody gets to heaven on a buddy pass, being decent person and occasionally attending church and, you know, uh, just kind of showing up. That's not what puts us in to Jesus' family. We don't get our ticket punched to heaven because we're kind of good. The encouragement now here is that no matter what you've done, you can be part of Jesus' family. You can belong. And it doesn't matter who's in your family of origin or what you've done. Being part of Jesus' family is possible. Those who are often the least likely are part of God's family. Belonging to Jesus' family is reserved for those who respond and live according to God's word of grace and truth. It is good to belong to Jesus' family. It really is. It is the best decision I ever made to follow Jesus. And I cannot tell you, I, it would, I, could, spend, I could spend several hours telling you stories of how Jesus' family has carried me through so many difficult life circumstances. But being part of this family is not easy. And the reason is because you're here. <laughs> because I'm here. Because we're here. You know, sometimes we just make some tragic decisions or we, we don't always get along. And that's why forgiveness is required to sustain any family, but especially God's family. And I love it. Tom Dace served as an active member of South, South Side Christian Church in Springfield, Illinois. And after a Saturday morning men's breakfast, he and a couple of his buddies went to uh, continue a remodeling project on an apartment that he had owned and was working on. And so they arrived there and they, you know, fire up their power tools and <clears throat> And Tom fires up a circular saw. But upstairs was a man who was hungover, drunk, and sleeping. And when that saw turned on, he became furious. He got out of his apartment, marched downstairs, picked up a hammer, and killed Tom Dace in cold blood right there. Several days later, Tom's wife, Florence, went to the county jail and visited him. And she approached his cell with a Bible in her hands and said, You have done a terrible thing. You have taken away my husband, my livelihood, and my Christian partner. I am not here to condemn you. I am here to love you. Then she handed Frank her husband's Bible, and she says, You owe it to me to read this book. And on the inside cover, Tom has wrote down, what a person must do to become a Christian. And he read it. Several months later, Frank was transferred to a maximum security prison. Florence went to visit him. And when she arrived, she found out that he had become a Christian. Uh, he, she embraced him, told him again that she had forgiven him. 
And then <clears throat> at his parole that came some years later, she advocated for his release. And then he established, Frank established a prison ministry in Arkansas that spread throughout the southwestern states. His life would not be defined by a terrible murder. His life would be defined by the love of Christ. This is why I love the church. This is why I love the church. The world doesn't do that. But God's family does. It provides redemption and second, third, fourth, fifth chances for people. This is what Jesus is establishing. A family where grace and love and truth are so so foundational to the relationships and that forgiveness is possible. Now, another thing that we should notice from this passage is this. Those who are out try to control Jesus. And those who are in submit to the control of Jesus. Remember, the family wants to protect the family name. Let's get Jesus out of the public eye. Everybody's going to think he's a nut. And then the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes, they've come, down, they've come up from Jerusalem. And they think that he's doing all this under the power of saying, everybody's trying to control Jesus. They're literally trying to seize him. And so Jesus, you got to understand, Jesus is not going to be controlled by anyone. He is Lord. He is King. He is the boss. We, we can do the same sometimes. We can, can try to control Jesus. We want Jesus to endorse our kingdom of politics or ascribe to our definition of sexuality or to ascribe to our understanding of materialism or what money is. To, like, we want to control G- Jesus. I hear what you're saying, but I'm in control of this part of my life. And Jesus says, you can't control me. You have to submit to me. Jesus' submission took place on a cross, a cruel cross, naked and bleeding, dying for the sins of humanity. And in that passion story, we're motivated to submit our entire life to his authority. Now, these Jewish leaders, they're accusing Jesus of of, of being controlled by the devil. They're wanting to marginalize Jesus. Teachers of the law, religious law, who arrived from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets his power to cast out demons. These Jewish leaders could not deny the fact that Jesus was accomplishing these miracles, but they're saying his power flowed from Satan himself. Now, I have known non-believers to scoff at the power of God in today's world. When someone tells their testimony, they roll their eyes. Oh, Jesus' story. He's a crutch for the weak. You know, he's, he's just... He's just used by people to make them feel good about themselves. Or they'll say something like, you know, Jesus was a good teacher, but he wasn't God. He doesn't give us that option. Like C.S. Lewis says, he's either Lord, liar, or lunatic. He is God or he's nothing. And so people outside the family of Jesus will look and try to discredit Jesus. But look at Jesus' response. Jesus called them over. He calls these religious people over and he says, How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splittered by by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Hey, scribes, it's a terrible strategy for Satan to destroy his own work. We know civil war wrecks a kingdom, feuding divides a family. I, Jesus, have entered the strong man's house because I am stronger. I am victorious. I am a warrior, and when I arrive in the second coming, my gown will, that I ride on my horse will be covered in blood, and I'll be carrying a sword. Like, get this, this idea of Jesus being some mamby, pamby, you know, flower-carrying type weirdo. He is a king, and there is nothing in our lives that can't be overcome by following and submitting to Jesus. 
Look, most of the time when we have problems in our lives, it's because we're only seeing the problem. We're looking, we're looking here. We're looking on this plane. And all we see is the problem. And all we see is our lack of resources. Or all we see is that person against us. Or all we see is a family history of whatever. What we need to do is look up. Look up. Behold the coming Christ. Behold the one who's overcome death itself. This Jesus is the deliverer of people who will submit to him. And I'm telling you, this family called Jesus' family is a family that every person must belong in. Those who submit to the control of Jesus are in Jesus' family. So how do we get in? Trust in Jesus and his forgiveness as a free gift. Confess Jesus as your Lord. Repent, that means turn away from your sin and choose to live according to God's plan for your life and be baptized. And it's possible that even though you accepted Christ but walked away, that doesn't mean you're out forever. You just return, you come back. I mean, Peter denied Christ three times in his his most desperate hours. Zacchaeus was a money-hungry tax collector. Paul persecuted Christians, often the least likely, a part of God's family. Those who are out, they deny Jesus to the end, and those who are in trust and obey Jesus. Now, there's one more really important lesson that I want to pull from this passage. It's found in Mark 3, chapter 28 through 30. These are some of the most feared verses... In all the Bible, they caused me to shudder in my shoes one time when I read them out of context. So in the Bible, remember, Jesus, in this section, Jesus has been accused by the Pharisees of doing God's work by the power of Satan. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he was possessed by an evil spirit. You're doing these good works by the power of the devil. Now, this is probably, as I said, one of the most feared verses in all the Bible. If you've ever read this and you... At one time, you were following Jesus, and then you fell away. You're like, I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Or, you know, as a child, I thought by taking the Lord's name in vain, which I did many times, I thought I had blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and I was unredeemable. But there's a rule that we must understand when we read the Bible. Context is critical to understanding content. So we have to read the whole passage here. And, And so... So you might be sitting here or you might be watching here and you think you've blown it. You think there's no possible pardon for you because uh, you have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Let me answer those fears with this quote from Mark Strauss. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the defiant, willful, and final rejection of the Spirit's work in one's life. It would also be true then that those who anguish over whether they have blasphemed certainly have not, since such fears reveal a conscience still wrestling with God. If you wondered that you've committed a sin that God can't forgive, I want you to know this. Your angst acknowledges your spirit seeking God's forgiveness and your Holy Spirit's invitation into Jesus' family. This is, this is what we have to recognize, that, that we're wrestling with sins that we've committed, good. You know, if, if you're feeling convicted about sin in your life, good. It leads to confession. It leads to releasing all that shame and guilt and accepting this grace and truth that Jesus provides. To deeply belong to God's family is one of the biggest blessings. And don't let, you, don't let Satan trip you up to think you've committed an act of, of, of sin, a transgression that cannot be forgiven by God's grace. I can assure you of this. Our sin can't outdo Jesus' grace. We just can't. We can't outdo it. We think we are so lost. But Jesus says, I want you to be part of my family. Look, look, mother, brother, sister, scribes. Look who's part of my family. Look look here. Look here who's part of my family. 
you know, we might even say if some outsider came into our group right now and they looked around and they, they used to know you, right? Some months ago, they, or some years ago, or maybe weeks ago, maybe they saw you somewhere and you're like, you mean they're part of Cornerstone? I love this story. I don't know if I have time to tell it, but one time there was a guy who attended. Oh, I talked about him already. The guy that drove the tractor to church, <coughs> Harry. Harry Gillespie was his name. And uh, he's with Jesus right now. But Harry told me one time, he said, Bob, he said, I told somebody where I was going to church. And they said, oh, you're going to the sinner's church. And I said, Harry, can, can I use that as an illustration? He said, sure, sure you can. So the next week, I found this uh, sign material and with, uh, with uh, red spray paint. I sprayed Sinner's Church in one foot letters and I stapled it together and I slid it over the cornerstone sign. Well, there was quite a buzz among the elders because I didn't tell them about it. <laughs> and we've been vandalized, you know, in all this. <laughs> I wanted the world to know this is a church that welcomes sinners. If you're far from God, make a decision be part of Jesus' family. Today is the day. Today is the day. And for you who are in, I'm not done yet, for you who are in, we have a responsibility and privilege to bring people into this family. I want you this week, possibly even before this day is over, ask a friend who doesn't attend church what would make them feel welcome if they came. Share that information with me. I'd love to know. We would love to know what barriers that might be here we don't see for other people to enter into this fellowship, this community, this family. We want people to know they belong no matter where they come from. I mean, look, y'all let me in here. I'll be back in the next step.